Epilogue. One last thought. And now I must confess, I am a bit anxious. Soon you will set this book down or turn this video off, and I am desperately searching for the right words to say. Like a mother and father standing on a railway platform, seeing their son off to war. I am groping for the words that will somehow move you to hold on to this. The train blows its whistle, the mother chokes up, and the father grabs the last handshake ever so tightly because they know what is at stake. My friends, so much is at stake. Two things must be said. I will hold myself to two. They are found late in the book of Hebrews, late in the Bible. They seem to be spoken in the same spirit of a railway platform farewell. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. I do not want you to lose heart, the author says in a fatherly way, his hand reluctant to let ours go. Fix your gaze on Jesus. The context of the passage is suffering, hatred, and opposition. We are urged to cling to Jesus. And so I must say something about suffering and clinging. An honest book about Jesus that does not address suffering is not an honest book. There are 143 million orphans in the world today. 35 million people worldwide have HIV. 27 million souls are currently slaves more than any other time in the history of the world. And then there are the wars and the earthquakes and the famines. I needn't go on. You watch the news. And Jesus warned us about this. Before his death, his teaching turned very sober. Nothing that would make a bestseller in this world of, tell me how to make life work now. You will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But this is all only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. And then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers and many will turn away from me and betray and hate one another and many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end will be saved see I have warned you from Matthew 24 well the man certainly knew how to shoot straight. I mean, if such as this was coming, the only loving thing to do was to cry out a warning. Then I'll not be making apocalyptic predictions, but I do want to point this out. Suffering is flooding the earth right now like a rising tide. Now listen carefully. This is the father on the platform fumbling for those last words. Suffering will try and separate you from Jesus. You must not let it. The worst part of suffering is the damage it can do to your relationship with God, to your view of God. Feelings of abandonment creep in. Why did he let this happen? Anger, a loss of hope, mistrust, forsakenness. At the very time you need him most, you will feel compelled to pull away from Jesus or feel that he has pulled away from you. This is what Hebrews was trying to prevent. Be very, very careful how you interpret your suffering. Interpretation is critical. 
don't jump to conclusions. Beware the agreements that you make. This is where the enemy can destroy you. Agreements get in such as God has abandoned me or it's my fault in some way or I've done something wrong and a host of others. If you've been making these agreements, you will want to break them. They allow a chasm to form between you and your Jesus. So, this is what Hebrews is trying to say. Do not lose heart because of your suffering. Cling to Jesus. Do whatever it takes to help you fix your gaze back on this beautiful outlaw. I say his name every time I take the stairs in our house, my friend Becky told me. As I go up or down, each step, I say the name Jesus. How many times is that? I asked. She chuckled. Oh, lots. 20 times up or down those stairs a day. It brings me back to him. That's the idea. Find those things that help you remember Jesus. Turn your heart toward him throughout the day. And as you do, his presence becomes more real. His love can come to you and his life can fill you. I try to keep a CD of favorite worship music in my car. I have a collection of odd items on my desk. Several rocks, a piece of driftwood, a few hawk feathers, a seashell. They are icons to me of stories of God coming through for me. I have notes, scriptures, and words from Jesus taped around my house, even on my bathroom mirror. And now I write them on my hand, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Toward the end of his days on earth, as the darkness of Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday raced toward him, Jesus gave us this remarkable promise. In the recreation of the world, when the Son of Man will rule gloriously, you who have followed me will also rule, starting with the 12 tribes of Israel. And not only you, but anyone who sacrifices home, family, fields, whatever, because of me, will get it all back a hundred times over, not to mention the considerable bonus of eternal life from Matthew 19 in the message. Now, did you catch that? the recreation of the world? My friends, I hope you understand that we get the whole glorious kingdom back. Sunlight on water, songbirds in a forest, desert sands under moonlight, vineyards just before harvest. Jesus fully intends to restore the glorious world he gave us. Paradise lost, paradise regained a hundred times over. This was what was in his own thoughts when he said as he passed the cup to his brothers in the upper room just before Gethsemane and the Gestapo, I'll not be drinking wine from this cup again until that new day when I'll drink with you in the kingdom of my Father. Jesus knew as sure as he knew anything that a new day was coming, and with it, a glorious kingdom. And there he knew we would feast again and raise our glasses, and he would break his fast. Food, drink, laughter, life. Cana was just a foretaste. Reading this verse, my son Blaine empathized to Jesus. You've been waiting a long time for that glass of wine. And Jesus, in his wry, honest, playful way, said, Tell me about it. Meanwhile, friends, make a practice of loving Jesus. Let him be himself with you. And let his life fill yours. And so if you found this helpful in any way, tell your friends. There are a lot of folks out there who need to know this beautiful outlaw until the second Cana. <laughs>